Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I am the editor of this book. I am pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Alexia Hudson Ward, author of Chapter 13, Open, Inclusive, and Diverse, The Academic Library of 2035. Alexia Hudson Ward is Associate Director of Research, Learning, and Strategic Partnerships of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Libraries. She is also Editor-in-Chief of Toward Inclusive Excellence, an award-dominated blog focused on diversity-centered research. Hudson Ward is an American Antiquarian Society member, a trustee of the Corning Museum of Glass, and a trustee at the Conversation U.S. edition. Throughout Chapter 13, Alexia Hudson Ward discusses the importance of purposeful planning and action to build a future that is inclusive and diverse in academic libraries. Factors such as library space, gener generational influences, and economic instabilities can influence whether the library remains stagnant or moves closer to an open and inclusive organization. Welcome, Alexia Hudson Ward. I'm so happy to talk to you today. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you so much for this invitation and also the invitation to contribute to what I think is such an important and wonderful work. So thank you. It's really, uh, it's my pleasure. So let's get this started. And I'd love to hear from you about what your vision is for the future of libraries in 2035. You know, it's always an interesting question because 2035 at one point sounded so far away. And in fact, it's not. It's, you know, a decade and some change, right? And so how do, how do I or, or anyone would think about the future, I would imagine, or a vision would be more evolutionary than kind of very tactically situated. So in my mind, I really see our future as being, you know, just really remarkably dynamic, remarkably complex, remarkably interesting, remarkably diverse, but definitely situated within the context of a more inclusive structure that takes into consideration the evolutionary changes that are happening, not just within the United States, but throughout the world. Well, thank you. Yeah, so that's a lot for us to be thinking about. And I'm wondering what what do you, are you most concerned about as you're thinking about that vision of libraries for the future? You know, I think about two accelerants, Sandy, quite frankly, that uh, give me pause. You know, I don't I won't necessarily say they keep me up at night, but they give me multiple pauses throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month in terms of our capacity currently to be able to respond to them. And that's the ongoing global climate crisis and the rise of AI. There's a lot of emphasis on, of course, generative AI and rightfully so, but there are other tools within the overarching artificial intelligence strata that we should also have some significant concerns about. And to me, libraries should definitely have some imprints in, especially when it comes related to things like patron privacy and security. So those are things that really concern me. Um, when I reflect back on the climate issue, I, you know, I haven't had a recent conversation with a colleague that hasn't involved some water infiltration or some other challenges that are compromising their physical spaces, their physical collections, and their technological infrastructures. And so to me, I think that you know, we understand these complexities intellectually. But the extent to which we are starting to build capacity and scale from an organizational design perspective has yet to be determined. And that's something that definitely concerns me. Thank you. So, you know, I know we have several important things to be concerned about, but what can let's think about what might be exciting um, for us to envision for the future as well. What So what excites you? The thing that excites me the most is really advancing more open scholarship through a very diverse lens. And so I feel, and, and I've said this, you know, over the course of many years, Sandy, that, you know, a lot of the open access and open scholarship endeavors have really been centralized or focused on Western culture. 
And as we know, and as I wrote in my chapter, you know, we have a continent, Africa, that has the largest youth population in the world, that their technological on-ramp is oftentimes a mobile phone. You know, the entire region that is referred to as the Global South now seeks partnerships, more dynamic partnerships, if you will, more intentional partnerships with uh, institutions and libraries on the Western side to really start thinking about the ways in which indigenous culture can be preserved, you know, more intentionally. I think that is so extraordinarily exciting. And what an incredible time for us to be able to place our professional imprints into ensuring that cultural heritage, to ensure that, you know, relics of the past and materials that are being currently developed are preserved for future generations, while also making sure that particularly when we think about the COVID crisis, and how all of the scholarship and the science around that, you know, the ways in which the world, there was more opportunities for the world to be more collaborative in terms of public health outcomes, in terms of, you know, some of those rich data sets that helped us to understand and contextualize the difference between, you know, COVID as an incident versus long COVID. Um, And so to me, all of those things makes this period in time for academic libraries just so extraordinarily exciting and our future exciting. That's, I think that's great. And I was so happy that you brought this perspective into the book and and that you surfaced this angle to our future and the importance of, um, of uh, thinking about um, our, you know, open scholarship through this diverse lens and bringing in some of the global perspectives that um, I think it was great to to hear and and I think um, expands our horizons in interesting ways. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's it's one of the things where you know I know that many of us have been committed to advancing what we have loosely described as DEI under a wide swath of initiatives. Um, however, our world is getting smaller and it's, and it feels to me like it's getting smaller each week, more small each week. And to not think of the ways in which we all have a collective partnership and coalition building and efforts around the ways in which we think about store, preserve, advanced data, store, preserve, advanced scholarship and knowledge was so important for me to share. So I appreciate your appreciation of that different <laughs> perspective. So thank you as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm, again, I think it's, it's great that to, I think it's a really great addition to the, um, to our thinking about the future. And so I, I wanna um, uh, reflect right now about what you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade. Wow, you know, I was reflecting on this um, as we were preparing for our conversation, you know, what are the things that I could pinpoint the most, right? Because it's it's a beautiful question. It's a complicated one because I think, you know, we go through a laundry list. We don't have enough time in the day or the week or the year to talk about it, right? But what I think that has happened on the positive perspective, Sandy, is that we've had more people of color move into the leadership ranks within libraries, particularly at you know what we would describe as the associate university librarian and the university librarian level. So over the past decade, we've seen just an array of really amazingly talented people finally reach those two top tier roles. Um, with some degree of traction, meaning that it's not just one person or two people, there's a significant number. Um, While that number needs to be improved, without a doubt, you know, the last decade has brought that forward. But I also think, you know, one of the challenges that we face that has arisen in the past decade is the evolution of what we would traditionally describe as the MLS degree or the MLIS degree and so-called traditional library and education. And so what I have been having conversations with our colleagues about is the need for the curriculum to incorporate more kind of managerial perspective, more kind of real, you know, traditional so-called boots on the ground perspective to situate that with some of the traditional ways in which we teach reference instruction, cataloging, et cetera. So 
in the past 10 years, I haven't unfortunately experienced a lot of, of delineation from when you and I were in school, right? And, and that concerns me. I just really feel like there's so much more opportunity to embed into the curriculum this new knowledge around data science, data management, open scholarship, global education, and, and we're, we are missing that. And so I would really love to see more of that take place. That's great. And like now let's position ourselves looking ahead. What do you think is going to have the biggest impact on libraries in the next decade? Definitely artificial intelligence, without mm -hmm. a doubt. Um, one colleague was recently saying to me that they feel like this is another Gutenberg moment, you know, from, mm -hmm. and I thought that was such a beautiful phrasing because it is so true that this technology and all of its subsequent accelerants will definitely shift what is going to take place from a workforce perspective, a workforce education perspective, a workflows education perspective, but also just generally the ways in which we would approach our day-to-day -day activities. And so to me, like that's the biggest change that I see happening and really right now, but in the, in the course of the next decade, I absolutely see us having full departments and roles dedicated to furthering how AI is incorporated, you know, across the curriculum from a librarianship perspective, as one example. Mm -hmm. Great. And I was wondering, I mean, I know our field changes quickly. I'm not sure if you have anything's changed in a few months since you've submitted your chapter, if your thinking has changed or um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting, Sandy, because none of us could have predicted the Israeli Hamas war mm -hmm. and the ways in which libraries in many aspects have become these spaces and places by which our institutions seek partnerships in advancing critical conversations, right? So we've always had a reputation while not necessarily branded specifically in this way, but our libraries have always had the reputation of being these nexuses for community engagement and belonging, right? But it feels like since the pandemic, we have moved from crisis to crisis to crisis, and libraries have been called into different duty to support, you know, fractures that are happening within the community. You know, of course, that wasn't anything that I could have necessarily had written at that time, although mm -hmm. upon reflection, I could have incorporated some more detail around how these um, difficult circumstances that are taking place, you know, be they in the United States or be they internationally, you know, how that's going to impact library work. You know, so for example, you know, I know within the case of, in the case of my library, but in the case of others, folks immediately moved out on developing lib guides to address anti-Semitism and Islamic phobia immediately moved out on partnering with various departments within their respective institutions to have, you know, really hard yet essential conversations around balancing free speech versus hate speech, right? And so when I when I reflect back on an open and diverse library of the future, to me, that's a piece that that is definitely missing in my chapter that, you know, I wish I would have had the opportunity, you know, to iterate on further because I think it's so important and it's going to continue. Well, I'm so glad that you brought that up and, you know, hopefully people will uh, uh, tune into this webcast so they can um, hear this additional perspective uh, as well. And uh, and it was interesting to hear the role of libraries because of course the, the Israel-Hamas um, situation is just one conflict of you know many that happen and yes. um, uh, around the world and that will likely happen again in the future in other places. So maybe this is an area that the library will continue to uh, play a role in in the future. Uh, unfortunately, and not not we hope there won't be more, but 
right. it seems like right. there will likely be more uh, conflicts in the future. So oh, absolutely. Uh, interesting absolutely. place for the library to, um, to be helping, um, as you said, uh, maybe uh, mend some of the fractures that exist in our communities. Yeah, and to enact a different form of leadership. Right. And mm-hmm. to demonstrate a different form of social intelligence at a time in which, you know, so many college community members are hurting. Right. And and our own teams are hurting. And so it's I'm not suggesting at all that, you know, people should be kind of these um, professional self-sacrificial lambs in the minute of crisis and, you know, just kind of throw your professional hat on and kind of tuck your feelings and and, you know, kind of move on. Um, what has been an interesting evolution that I think will continue is also the centering of our marginalities and identities in these complexities and how that helps to inform the ways in which we will do our work currently and in the future. You know, so many people would say in the past that in some aspects, marginalities were downplayed in academia and in academic libraries. Yet what I see happening and what I think will be a continued I don't want to say trend, but will be a continuance of what will take place for libraries in the future is to say, hey, I bring all of these important identities to this work, right? And so therefore it informs differently how I can partner with faculty, with researchers, with students, with staff outside the libraries on how we determine what is the best information to get out, how to combat disinformation that arises in the midst of conflicts, right? That we can agree disagreeably, if you will, without there being, you know, this desire to deconstruct, you know, one's entire career, because we had that happening. Unfortunately, we have these external forces that are coming into the fold of what's taking place at colleges and universities and literally, you know, attempting to reshape not only curriculum, but actually, you know, aiming to remove people from their positions. We've never seen this happen before, right? And some of it is fueled by whether they be deliberate or or not, you know, they're fueled by disinformation campaigns. And so to me, this is the moment where the evidence base, the database, the truth base, the knowledge base detail must absolutely come to the fore. And we're the, we are the people that are best capacity to help with this, absolutely. And to lead with it in some aspects. I think that's, uh, uh, you know, I think that's connects us to the next, a little bit to the next question I wanna ask you, which is, um, you know, you're just talking about all these complexities that, that libraries are addressing. Uh, so do you have any advice for information professionals as they look toward the future in the next 10 years? I do. I do. So one of the things that I think is important for anyone, whether you are deciding to be an individual contributor or if your career trajectory is moving towards a leadership role, it's important to understand all of the aspects of how the library works, right? So not just the four corners of your existing position, But how does administration work? How does administrative services work? How are how does the finances of this particular place work? How does strategic partnerships and planning and engagement with faculty and researchers work? Really understanding that helps to enrich and inform the ways in which you can be successful in in your position, you know? And so I, I think that's so vital and getting that knowledge can come in an assortment of ways. So some institutions I know like yours, you know, has a management track, offers management courses, you know, others can kind of seek those individual kind of learnings out through um, open access courseware, et cetera, you know, and then just sometimes just asking a leader, you know, many of us are so open to having conversations with people about this is how things work. You know, so if you're going to a conference or even if you just want to set up a Zoom meeting, I think that that has to happen and that has to be an ongoing commitment to understanding the changes that are taking place and the forces that impact those changes. I think it's absolutely important for information professionals today and for the future. 
Uh, that's great. And is there anything that information professionals can do to better prepare for their desired future? I think that it's important, Sandy, to kind of understand what are the core elements that are that I would describe as the oil of the engine of academic libraries, right? So without a doubt, we all know and see already the impact of artificial intelligence on libraries. So I think you have to now come in informed on what it is, what those tools are, what you think the majority of the population, the patron population that you will be serving will be using and getting some hands-on intimacy with it. So that's part one. The part two, which I, I suggest to my team at MIT all the time, is while you're working on tooling oneself around the technology to also keep a gaze on the literature, right? That is coming out in relationship to the scientific evolutions of AI, the algorithmic biases that are situated within it and how leaders outside of academia are thinking about how to prepare their workforces for this onslaught of detail, right? And so it so to me, there's that balance. Like you have to maintain currency in relationship to the tooling, but you also should keep an intimacy with the evolutionary research that is taking place. So you'll be able to speak from an informed perspective, you know, by, both operationally and strategically. That's great. And um, also, I think I want, I'd like to also ask around, um, what do you think are the key competencies that librarians are going to need to be able to thrive in the year 2035? I think agility and flexibility and the ability to be able to demonstrate team leadership are the three that are so essential. You know, and and particularly, I think, for individuals who are very happy and satisfied with being individual contributors, that doesn't mean that you for, forego the responsibility of being an excellent team player and what that looks like. Right. Because the work of libraries is is rapidly de siloing. So these ideas of, you know, you kind of do this work within these very strict four corners and there's no parallelism to the intersections of that with the work of another unit is quickly dissipating. There's so much intersection and interplay with how all of our units within the libraries work or are expected to work. And so it's vital that you be flexible that you have some agility, that you're not so, you know, kind of focused on this is the way, this is my truth and belief, and this is how I'm going to do it, and this is the way it needs to be done. It's like, okay, you got to be open <laughs> to some change, um, but definitely enacting and building up one's skills in team leadership, I think, is is super critical, too. I have one last question for you, and that is, I would love you to define the future, your view of the future of libraries in six words. Oh, it's such a tough challenge. So I know. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. You know, I like to talk, so I'm going to do my best. So, uh, you know, I, I would succinctly define it, and it's probably less than six words, as, you know, dynamically adaptive. Um, that is something that guided my um, entry for your amazing book. It is something that guides my thinking as a leader. It is a principle that guides the ways in which I engage in my work every day is that we, the future of libraries is dynamically adapted. I think that's a great, um, you win so far for the shortest, uh, pithiest one. Um, <laughs> but I think that's, I, I think it really captures the spirit. So uh, good job. Thank you. So I'd, I'd like to thank you, uh, Alexia Hudson Ward for joining me today. And I also want to thank you again for your great contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It has been an absolute pleasure to talk with you today and to hear more about your vision for the future of libraries. Thank you, Sandy, so much again for this opportunity. It was a treat to speak with you as well. 
And thank you also for attending this webcast with Alexia Hudson Ward, author of Chapter 13, Open, Inclusive, and Diverse, the Academic Library of 2035. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you for attending.